master gives a blessing. Is what you are about to listen to is a podcast produced by Philoclea Ministries. Philoclea Ministries is offered to all free of charge. However, there are real and immediate needs associated with it. If you are a regular listener or enjoy any of the content produced by Philoclea Ministries, we humbly ask that you consider becoming a contributor. You can learn more about our funding needs at www.philocleaministries.org. Please note that Philoclea Ministries is not a 401c3 nonprofit organization and that contributions are not tax deductible. Supporting Philoclea Ministries is just like supporting your other favorite podcasters and content creators. And all proceeds pay the production bills, make it possible for us to pay our content manager, and provide a living stipend for Father David. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Christ is born, we glorify him. Welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Evercatinos. We are picking up with the second volume, which we just started a couple weeks ago. And we are, uh, I believe, in the second hypothesis on page 29, number three. And for quite a while now, we've been discussing humility. And uh, tonight, we continue along with that theme, but in particular, looking at how one bears with both insults, but also praise uh, in the struggle to maintain uh, humility. And uh, I just wanna give everybody a little bit of a heads up and maybe a warning. There are some of the paragraphs that are a little jarring. And uh, there's a couple of paragraphs that one might uh, in reading them think are racist because they refer to a person in a racist fashion. Uh, in, in terms of how uh, 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 Moses the Black or Moses the Strong was treated, especially when he was being ordained. And, uh, and so it deals with how he deals with uh, insults and ridicule. But uh, some of the passages are a little disconcerting to read. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up and warning about that. Um, so very challenging section and if everyone can hold on until we are about 10 pages forward there's something that is mentioned uh, where the authors uh, bring to kind of clarity why we would go to such lengths uh, uh, in terms of humility itself why would we would allow ourselves as it were to sink to such depths if you will, and being insulted and bearing insults. And I think from uh, just our, our daily sensibilities that it's a hard thing to imagine and, and a hard thing to see why this would be something that could lead to virtue, but also lead to a kind of freedom and joy. Uh, as with so many of the things that we've talked about in the past, uh, and then one of the fathers will bring something forward that gives a kind of aha moment. Uh, and so hold on through some of these. They're very difficult to read. Uh, but uh, once we get there, I think some clarity will come. So again, we're on page 29 with number three. The elders relate that a few dried figs were once given to the skeet. Because they were of poor quality, none of them was sent to Abba Arsenius so as not to insult him. When Elder Arsenius was informed of this, he would not attend the usual gathering, Synaxis, of the monks, saying, they have cut me off from the brotherhood by not giving to me from the blessings that were bestowed upon the brothers by God, and of which I was not worthy to partake. All who heard this benefited from the humility of the elder. Immediately thereupon, the priest of the skeet went to take him figs, and with great joy, he returned with the elder to the monastic gathering. 
So rather peculiar story. They get some rotten figs <laughs> brought to the skeet and they don't want to insult the elder. And what insults him is that they elevate him in esteem and don't count him worthy to receive simply what was given, the humble offering that was given to the skeet and uh, allowing him to uh, experience something of, you know, having to receive, you know, something that was, uh, for most of us, subpar quality figs. And, uh, and so seeing himself is not part of the brotherhood because they had elevated them elevated him in esteem above themselves and so we begin to see in the stories of some of these elders that some of them found it quite painful uh, to bear with praise or this kind of elevation in the eyes of others as we would often perhaps feel uh, great pain at being insulted uh, by others and this is what uh, we see in this story and so they gain a kind of edification there that, you know, he does not want to be seen or held as unique among the brothers or worthy of greater, uh, greater goods. Number four, it is said of Abba Amonis that several people went to him to have him settle a dispute. The elder, however, played stupid, pretending to be a fool. A woman standing near him said, this elder is stupid. Now, when the elder heard this, he called her up close to him and said, I have undertaken so many labors here in this desert to attain this stupidity. And now today for you, I should set it aside? No. <laughs> oh boy. Every once in a while, these stories make me crack up, but uh, you know, that I've, I've entered into the desert precisely in order to you know, develop this kind of stupidity. And, uh, and so I'm not going to set it aside for you, uh, you know, is somehow uh, this being a special day or outside the norm. And uh, again, it sort of captures for us uh, in a humorous way, uh, this sense that they had of themselves, you know, again, entering into the monastery, embracing the monastic life was not to have an elevated view, view of themselves and their character or or their particular path in life and uh and and so whether although humorous it does make the point rather clearly in the hermit's cells a monastic gathering once was once held regarding a certain matter at this gathering abba of Agrius also spoke thereupon the presbyter said to him Abba, we know that. Were you in your homeland? You might perhaps be a bishop or the leader of many people, but here you are a foreigner. The Abba, feeling stung by this, but without becoming upset, bowed his head saying, truly it is so, Father. I spoke once. I will not speak a second time. So out of a kind of courtesy, he acknowledges the statement of the one brother that he is from a different land and quite possibly what the brother said is true uh, but this is the last time that he will uh, engage such a question because part of the monk's life as we've seen in uh, the latter of divine ascent is exile that uh, uh, stepping away from the things that are familiar in order to cling solely to God. And so Evagrius would have entered into the desert and made himself a foreigner precisely to avoid those possibilities and uh, imagine would not want others to know where he was from or that this was true, that he would have been held in such high esteem that he would have been elevated uh, to a higher position within the life of the church. Philip Neary uh, often had similar little things in his life, not so, much so dramatic as this, uh, but um, his father once, who was, you know, a lot of times people are very focused on like genealogies and his father had put together one for him 
you know, laying out his heritage and had sent it to him. And uh, he ripped it up, you know, having no desire within his heart uh, for such dignities or to think of himself in such a way, but to keep his focus on the kingdom. And uh, it's also true that he never returned to his home either in Florence after having left home as a, as a young man, um, preferring, you know, to remain, uh, not that he remained anonymous for very long, given his humility, but uh, not that he might rest upon those things. Number six, Abba John said that the door uh, to heaven is humility. And our fathers entered into the city of God after having tasted of many insults. And so, you know, we've talked about this in previous groups, that humility is not having a negative view of oneself or even being held in low esteem by others, but it is being conformed to Christ who empties himself. And this we should understand very well, having celebrated the feast that we just did, that you know, he empties himself, takes our flesh upon himself, becomes an infant. And, uh, and so, um, unlike the other virtues, it conforms us to him in such a way uh, that uh, it includes all the other virtues, but it also uh, allows us to participate in the very essence of the life of God, that this is part of what God has revealed of himself to us in giving us his only begotten son and in and through the incarnation, that humility, this self-emptying love is part of the very quality of God, essence of God himself. And so they are willing and desirous to enter in through this door and enter the city of God uh, through many insults that there is not so many that one would bear within this life that would make them desire anything else. Number seven, the same Abba said to his brother, even though we are quite insignificant before men, let us be glad for this so that God might honor us. He was always of warm spirit, it so happened that someone who once visited him complimented him on his handiwork. He occupied himself with plating ropes. He remained silent. Again, the visitor complimented him on his handiwork, and once more, he remained silent. When the visitor complimented him a third time, Abba John told him, from the moment that you came in here, you removed God far from me. And so the, the visitor was not picking up uh, very clearly on what the silence was teaching him, uh, that the Alba was not interested in compliments and was engaging in the work, uh, not for that purpose, and certainly had engaged in the monastic life, not for that purpose as well. And so, um, although visiting and maybe holding the monks in high regard, there still wasn't an understanding upon the part of the visitor as to why they had embraced the life. And that is, you know, I think often true in our own day. You know, we often elevate uh, individuals in our own mind for a whole host of different reasons. And that's true of clergy and religious. And, uh, but, you know, religious aren't impervious to the dangers that are being put forward to us here in this particular hypothesis, that uh, compliments uh, can be a dangerous thing to one who is pursuing humility and uh, to free oneself from the trappings of the ego. And, uh, and so often the path of silence is the, the best one for us. Number eight, the same Abba was also once standing in the skeet where the brothers were gathered around him confessing their thoughts. One of the elders said to him, John, just as a prostitute spruces herself up in order to attract lovers, so you also do. 
Embracing him, Abba John told him, what you say is true, Father. After this event, some of the disciples asked him, Abba, were you not at all disturbed by this within yourself? And he replied, no, for as I appeared to be externally, so I am internally. That, you know, there is a refining of one's sensibilities as one's purity of heart grows. And while it might be hard for the other elders to see the, the truth of this, that how he was, appears externally and what he was criticized for was true internally, that, um, that despite the, having embraced this life, he's known all too well uh, the, the ways that we can seek to uh, be held in esteem by others, liked by others, held in high regard, thought to be bright, thought to be holy. And all of these things can be very subtle and the thoughts can come to one's mind you know, hundreds of times throughout the course of the day or when we feel slighted to feel anger or frustration. And so while it might not be true at that moment, he certainly knows that it is ever so true uh, throughout the course of his day-to-day -day life. And I think practically for all of us, uh, you know, as we enter into this kind of spiritual warfare and as we seek to be attentive to our thoughts, we see how often they turn to the self and uh, to self-image and, uh, you know, even things like mirrors in modern time modern times have think become sort of this way that you know people are constantly checking on themselves you know to see what they look like or what they might appear like in the eyes of others and i don't think previous generations could possibly be as self-conscious in that regard not having the ability to do that or at least the common man and woman wouldn't have had the ability uh to do that so much and uh, but beyond that, you know, I think uh, we are formed very much in our culture to be self-conscious. And there is a kind of narcissism that we all struggle with. And there are a lot of things in our culture that feed it. And so I think when we read things like this, uh, it, it's often hard for us to see that they're purgative or that they're medicinal, that they're curative. And I think this is what the, the fathers came to see, that when one was able to freely embrace the insults, seeing them for what they are, they could see the healing grace that would come through them, the, the, how they would become free of uh, the dominion of the ego, if you will, and the narcissism that often flows from it. Number nine. Abba James said, let him who is complimented think of his sins and keep well in mind that he's not worthy of the things that he is told, so that he will not be too badly damaged by these compliments. <laughs> you know, again, I think uh, if, if there's always a danger of putting these readings out there, and I, I've often struggled with this idea of quoting the fathers and putting them in social media, especially out of context, uh, because I think there's something in these, you know, the whole attitude of mind, the habit of mind is so foreign uh, to how we think in our own day that um, self-esteem uh, is elevated as being so important, you know, a person's self-image. And, you know, psychology has come into play here too. We know the damage that can be done uh, to people when they live in an environment that is abusive, especially when they're younger. And, uh, but uh, when this is unchecked and certainly unchecked in light of the reality of the spiritual life, when the state of the soul is not does not really come into a person's evaluation of their life uh, and the impact of what how, what others say to them 
both positive and negative, how that has, has an impact upon them spiritually, then we can swing in the opposite direction as well, where we can have this inflated view of the self, you know, where everyone's praised, where everybody's receiving a, an award, where, you know, no grades are given, you know, where, you know, they're, it's, it's, it's seen as being uh, somehow damaging to the self, uh, not to be constantly complimented, uh, but in reality, it can it is easily created create a distorted view of the self, a wounded view of the self, as undergoing constant ridicule in one's youth. The, the damage to the the mind and the heart uh, can be equally, uh, you know, wounding to us if. You know, we, we have this inflated view of the self. And because at that point, you know, we take our focus off of Christ. And we take our focus off of the nature of the spiritual battle. A little bit few, further on, it talks about, uh, you know, how we can see that, you know, reaching up to pride, you know, reaching up to the heavens, cast one down to hell. And to sink down into hell, reaching for this humility, elevates one and can exalt them up to heaven. And when there is no sense of this, uh, then uh, there, there's nothing that is guiding us uh, in the spiritual battle. And so I think then we become easy game uh, for the, the demons in one direction or another. And um, and so, so I think it's important for us to be able to read the, these these texts in this kind of way, you know, certainly to understand what you know modern psychology tells us about formation of identity, uh, but also to see where there are blind spots and hard spots there as well, that we have to you know think about things critically across the board, Father even. Uh, Caesar Pagan knew to a solemn mortalis, how much more humble should we be? Right, you know, th that inevitably we are, are faced with our own mortality. And uh, this in and of itself, you know, the fact that we don't live forever should be the humbling thing that gives clarity of vision to us. And this is why we find and John Climacus and others, this the constant remembrance of death as being able to free us, you know, not only from, you know, this kind of egotism, but uh, from so much more. Number 10. It is said of Abba Macarius that when some brother visited him, thinking him a great elder and showing him great respect, the elder would not speak with him at all. However, if one of the brothers said to him, as if to humiliate him, Abba, when you were a camel driver and were caught stealing saltpeter and selling it, did the jail guards beat you? If indeed one of them spoke to him in this way, he would happily answer anything that he was asked. Uh, I don't know if that actually happened to <laughs> Marcarius or, or not, or if it was just being said to humiliate him. Uh, but in either case, uh, to be able to happily receive it and uh, to be humbled by it, so not to be held in such high esteem by the others. Eric, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, back on your uh, comments on the previous paragraph, I think I've kind of have the advantage of being on both sides of the equation. In other words, I've been able to, to I've been in a situation where I felt low self-esteem and I felt that I needed to get, you know, quote unquote, high self-esteem and fall into all the, the psychological babble that, that, that goes on about that. Um, and I would have been very difficult for me to handle this at that point in my life, but I've reached a point in my life where um, 
I can appreciate that um, the 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 value of not having esteem for myself much much more, um, and um, it's I can see how this would be very difficult for some people to depending on where they are in their lives to to understand, but um, I right. think there's a there's a hope of getting to a point in your life where you can appreciate it and and value it and uh, put it into practice. Yeah, you know, I think a big part of the issue, you know, certainly in our lives and in our families, even and within the Christian community, is our lack of focus on Christ and on Christ as the standard for us as human beings, both in terms of how we love others and our capacity to see the dignity of the other, uh, but also to to understand where our true identity and dignity comes from as well, uh, that cannot be taken away from us. And when, the, when that standard is lacking and this standard is, you know, is, that is taken is, you know, one of the you know, many things in this world that are, you know, are held up for us to emulate or to pursue there's always going to be something painfully lacking there, uh, both in those who form us or those who, whose formation we are responsible for, uh, and that it can affect our experience of the world around us. And to think, you know, if one's heart was, you know, fully given over to Christ and that we loved like him, but we're also able to bear you know, with the things of this life, understanding, uh, you know, our true dignity and identity, then uh, our capacity to to hold fast to the peace of the kingdom uh, would be f far greater. And I think so often we are left adrift, uh, not, you know, grasping at things to to give us identity. I mean, it can be, you know, some something as simple as how people dress, piercings, all, all kinds of things, you know, or uh, things that they pursue within the world, you know, something to hold on to, to give meaning and identity. And uh, I think we don't bear witness to that. And really, the, the saints can only bear witness to it fully. It's not going to come through words. Uh, but through the example of someone living uh, in the freedom of Christ, who's put on Christ and, you know, is not shackled uh, by sin and, uh, you know, the, the self-esteem that so often drives us. Carol Roper wrote, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Michael wrote, there is also an intense marketing that bombards the self-help of self-help, non-Christ focus to recognize as soft attacks. It's a good way of putting it because I think this these are one of the things that we will gravitate towards. And you know, there are plenty of people that put themselves out as the modern gurus, you know, to present us with means to, you know, achieve certain goals to elevate our ourselves and uh, uh, by you know, simply, you know, shaping our vision of our life in a certain way that allows us to go and pursue the things that we want for ourselves. And reality doesn't work that way. You know, there's no perfect plan for avoiding the crosses in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, the, the big, when I was younger, I think the bigger name was that Tony Robbins, you know, I don't know if, know if he's still around or, or not. And, uh, uh, but so many, I mean, I think have come down the line and, uh, and not to speak against them because I don't know what their hearts are, but I think this is what people, they're filling a void. And, uh, and I think whenever there is a profound void, people are going to gravitate to something that seems to nourish or seems to give hope or something to grasp onto. Carol Roper writes, his response to the camel driver comment, his happiness helps me understand the wisdom 
of the holy fool who sometimes almost seems to provoke those comments from others there's a wisdom in seeing the disapproval of others as protective of one's soul i'm thinking of the movie ostrov the island yes that's right you know and again it's seeing uh this as being curative medicinal purgative of purging you know the things within us that do lead to to pride and you know the in that movie that you mentioned the island or ostrov there is a character uh who does play the holy fool and uh despite his own sinfulness god is acting acts through him in this very powerful way even through the you know to the point of healing others casting out demons and yet everybody in the monastery thinks he's a complete idiot and he shovels coal for the you know to provide heat for the monastery and uh uh and so it's i think in terms of modern film every once in a while they'll get it right they'll 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 capture something and ostrov was one of those I, I think it was a superb movie that really captured something of this spirituality so again you know i don't often recommend movies but this would be this would be one eric Iwanko writes i think that there is truth in the idea that the phenomena of low self-esteem is really a hidden expression of pride uh well, it can be. I mean, I I think it depends on how that takes shape, which can, you know, can be, you know, through a multitude of ways. I think there are those who grow up and are just belittled from day one uh, because of the incapacity of parents or siblings. And so they come out of that with pretty deep wounds and often that will make it almost an impossibility to believe themselves as being loved by god and so often i think priests and others you know have to help you know un undo some of that uh to even be able to approach god in order to even to experience then a deeper kind of healing to know oneself as loved uh fully and uh as we truly are with all of our our wounds and and unconditionally and uh but uh this low self-esteem again depending on how it emerges can you know fall into a kind of self-hatred um but you know i think there's a lot of things though that in society produce it you know these expectations of how again people how people will look um you know what school they go to you know there a while back there are all these people paying for their children to be able to get into certain colleges you know because even though they hadn't earned, hadn't earned it uh because again it would provide them uh with a leg up but you think gee what would that do to your self-image over time if you if you were aware of that first of all you know that you got into this college and really hadn't hadn't earned it on any level but was paid for by your parents i think that would be pretty diminishing so there are a lot of different things i think it's living in the truth truthful living that is healing and uh so it's humility that ultimately uh brings healing whether the self-esteem is produced by pride or by the wounds that we bear from other times. Many times, uh, Michael writes, too self-deprecating humor or clamoring of being such a sinner can also be forms of vanity. No, yes, uh, I think that can be true, you know, that where it plays out in a public forum and uh, where one can be seeking self-pity or to become the, uh, where, the depression or despair is put on public display rather than being dealt with maybe more directly and in an attention seeking kind of way and because it you know it can satisfy what one 
craves, which is the attention uh, of others, even if it does come through something like this, you know, that I'm a poor wretched sinner or, you know, I'm uh, incapable of pursuing this path, whatever it might be. I think Dom, Dom Lorenzo Scapoli warned against this. Yes, yeah, Scapoli, I'd say in cl closer to modern times, he's like one of the Desert Fathers, his, his work, Spiritual Combat, which we've mentioned here a number of times, is just superb. Okay, we'll move on to uh, paragraph 11. The following is told about Abba Moses the Black. When he became a clergyman and his vestments were put on him, the archbishop said to him, now you have become completely white. To this, Abba Moses responded, alas, did the Pope ordain the inner or the outer man? Wishing to test him, the archbishop told the other clergy, when Abba Moses enters the holy altar, throw him out, but follow him to see what he says. So when he came into the altar, they chided him and threw him out. He on exiting said to himself, they treated you correctly, you black-skinned Negro. Since you are not a human, why should you expect to be among humans? So, you know, this is one of the sayings that I had talked about. And, you know, Moses, Abba Moses, is an extraordinary figure in terms of conversion of life and depth of of you know certainly of humility but of holiness uh he had been a murderer and had you know even led sort of a gang of uh, of men and was capable and had committed the worst of crimes before his conversion and uh yet his repentance was so deep uh and the transformation that came through the grace of god that he you know, had gained this reputation for holiness of life. And uh, the archbishop, I think, understands this and seeks to put it, put it to the test and wants to see how he'll respond to it. And uh, it must have been shocking to them. And it's going to come up again that he does not, you know, respond to this in uh in the way that one would expect him you know evidently he was a very large man capable of you know he was capable of doing great violence uh and uh even when he a group of uh men tried to raid the monastery and attack the priest and steal their property he had gathered them all up, tied them up, and carried them on his shoulders to the monastery and asked the monks what he wanted them, what he wanted him to do, what they wanted him to do with them. And uh, eventually they all convert uh, to the, the, the faith. But uh, you know, that I think he had an awareness of the the depth and the vestiges of those sins and uh that again being thrust down into the depths of humility into a hell uh again to the lowest point of humility both in regards to how he would see himself and how others saw him is something that exalts one to the heights of heaven he who humbles himself will be exalted and he who exalts himself will be humbled and again you know referring what to what is going to come that you know we know that pride makes one fall to hell and made one fall to hell that knew heaven itself and uh and so we see these monks being willing to endure i think from certainly a modern perspective but it does, i don't even think it has to be a modern perspective i think just from human sensibilities enduring a kind of hell of being belittled you know in all these different ways including skin color here and uh, and i don't think it's because of his skin color that he thinks himself wretched so much as how he had lived lived his life that here he's being elevated to holy orders to be a priest when he had led a life that he knows 
you know, was uh, filled with violence and murder. Um, I'm not sure if rape was one of the the, the one of the crimes that he had committed uh, as well, but it was a really a kind of violent life. So I think those why he stands out, you know, certainly among the fathers as being this image of great conversion. But we see the depth of it here, that even being uh, attacked in this way, that he takes himself even further down, uh, lowers himself even further than what is, is being said of him and done to him, he's thrown out. An elder said, he who is shown by men more honor than he deserves is harmed. Those whom men do not show honor at all, however, will be glorified in the heavens by God. Um, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Uh, you know, that this is what we are promised within the world, that the, the path that is set before us is not one of honor, but of dishonor. It's downward mobility. Our path is not one of upward mobility. Uh, despite the fact that we cling to that uh, in so many different subtle ways. And again, with the, the fathers, they, they, uh, because they leave, leave the world behind so much and they strip themselves so completely uh, that what is pre presented to us is this unvarnished truth about the reality of what it is to be a human being in this world and an unvarnished truth about the nature of sin and the depths to which it takes us and of pride, uh, but also the, the, the cross that is set before us and the path that is set before us, the narrow way, the narrow gate, and this kind of humility uh, that keeps reaching deeper in order to conform itself to Christ. That no matter how humbled we are in this world, that uh, it never uh, can match uh, what Christ himself endured. Uh, there's a little paragraph coming up, it just pops back into mind. And I think I quoted it here online. And it, it's one of those things that sort of uh, is a little bit jarring to say the least. Uh, hold on for one second. Here it is. Since then our Lord is good. He's given us his holy commandments. Uh, analogous with our evils, which expunge our evils by cauterization and purgatives. It is indeed impossible for us to be delivered from our sickness in any other way, save by proper and appropriate therapies. Um, but in the next paragraph, he says, and even if the whole body of mankind were to become tongues, so as to accuse me for my shortcomings, it would not be possible to describe to the extent deserved my disgrace. <laughs> so if the entire body of all of mankind became tongues simply to, uh, to tear us down, to disgrace us, it really does not capture the fullness of the truth, that we don't see the, the truth of the nature of our sin. Uh, as often we don't tr see the true nature of the love of God and taking that sin upon himself, what was born on our behalf. And I thought that image was incredibly powerful uh, that, you know, that if every, you know, of all mankind, you know, if everybody became only tongue, you know, wagging those tongues at us to debase us, it would still not reach the truth. And, you know, if, if read indiscriminately, of course, you know, somebody could say, ah, if somebody just read this, it would destroy them, you know, in the sense of their dignity, or again, if they had low self-esteem. But 
when we read this, we, we read it in the full context of all the fathers that we've been reading through the Evergetinos and John Climacus, Cassian, Isaac the Syrian. And what they've all said about humility is that it raises us up to taste the, the life of the most holy trinity, to participate in the life of the trinity. That in the end, nothing is lost to us and everything is gained. And it becomes very difficult for us to believe that on any level until we taste it. And I think this is why we see the, the fathers pushing to go deeper and deeper in order that they might taste for themselves something of that wisdom, that they might consume it and be transformed by it, and so then pursue it with even greater zeal, that, that where they begin to experience something of that life of the kingdom now the freedom uh, from pride and how that allows us to see ourselves and to see others and the nature of our life. And so, you know, taking one paragraph out of context uh, sort of destroys everything that we've talked about for this last year and a half or so, uh, or two years or maybe, was it two years or two and a half years? I can't remember how long we've been at it now. Two years or so, give or take a few months. And uh, that we've come to see, you know, that it's not a virtue in the way that we think of it being a virtue, humility. And that, again, it is something of the experience of God himself. Uh, because this is how God has revealed himself to us. And so long as we make it something much less, you know, uh, self-hatred, self-contempt, then we lose sight of that which is given in and through it and what we become in and through it. It's taking the opposite path that has led us away from God. Let's see, number 12, number 13. A brother asks a certain elder, tell me something which I can apply in order thereby to achieve eternal life. And the elder answered, if you can bring insult upon yourself and accept this insult, this is the greatest accomplishment, one greater than all the virtues. This is what Carol mentioned in her comment uh, up above that almost seeming to provoke these comments from others, like the individual in the island. And here we see uh, a count, similar counsel being given. How do I achieve eternal life? Well, uh, that you bring it all upon yourself, accept it, and see this as the greatest accomplishment. And again, it seems like a kind of insanity, uh, a, a kind of foolishness and in the eyes of the world and and indeed it is it's the same kind of foolishness that is the cross and that the world will always see as being foolish and always see as a stumbling block and so if on some level we weren't struggling with this uh then i think there would almost be something wrong because uh or we're saints that we can freely embrace the cross without being unsettled by it, and that we would freely embrace this without being unsettled by it or shaken by it, uh, I think would be pretty unusual as well. Especially this idea of, you know, joyfully embracing it or seeing it as a great accomplishment. Nobody in the world is seeking this accomplishment or putting it on their resume. <laughs> you know, I'm considered a fool by all. And, you know, put that on my CV. Number 14. An elder said, a humble man is not he who is self-deprecating and who uses humble words, but he who joyfully endures the deprecations and dishonor that are directed to him by his neighbor. So joyfully, you know, how, how can this be true? Uh, 
that a person could find joy in what the world would find reprehensible unless they were to find Christ in it, unless they were to find God in the experience itself, that in the cross of it, they experience a deeper intimacy with he who was rejected by the world and rebuked and scorned, crowned with thorns, rebuked, spit upon, and then pinned to the cross. Uh, Carol writes, but given your previous comment about the tongues, it's not foolishness, it's truthfulness, humility. We're just blind to the truth. That's true. That's right. That, you know, again, if every tongue was wagging against us, it wouldn't uh, be near uh, to the truth. And again, you know, foolishness in the eyes of the world. The same elder said another time, if a man praises you to your face, immediately call to mind your sins and ask him to stop. In the name of God, brother, say to him, stop praising me, for I am wretched and do not deserve it. Now, if the man who has praised you is a person of importance, one of rank, then pray inwardly from your heart to God. Say, protect me, O Lord from the praise and slander of men. And so, you know, there might be certain, he says, even if there are certain circumstances where, you know, you can't rebuke who it is that is saying this to you, then pray to God, you know, to, to bring it to an end, you know, or not to let it to have an un, undue effect upon you. Abba John the Short was once sitting in front of the church. The brothers were gathered around him, confessing their thoughts. When one of the elders saw this, he was overcome with jealous anger and said to the Abba, your pot is filled with poison. John quietly said to him, so it is, Abba, but you said this on seeing what is on the outside. If you could see what is on the inside, then what what would you not say? So, you know, he does see a kind of vanity that uh, can exist, despite the fact that it is driven by jealous jealousy here. But if, if it is something that drives him to jealousy, that perhaps there is a way that it's being done. You know, this re revelation of thoughts confessing of one's thoughts in a very public forum uh but you know he takes it freely and says okay you're really only seeing the outside of the pot you know if you saw the inside you'd be even more disgusted than what you are now uh let's see here michael writes father do you know the greek or latin used to translate to, to foolish no, I'd, I'd have to tr try to find that uh, and, and look it up. It's a good question, though. I wonder if it's similar to what Paul uses in the scripture. I, I don't know. I'd have to find out. Uh, Rebecca Therese. Being considered a fool by all would bring someone closer to Christ because that person would not be distracted by the esteem of others. It's not so helpful being considered a fool by all if others think they need to fix you because this is also a distraction <laughs> right uh that's true uh you know this person's insane this person needs help you know there's obviously something wrong with them you know let me help you here you obviously have poor self-esteem uh yes you know it's so sort of an interesting thing you know how we look at formation these days and i know i've talked about this before uh, you know and, and you know my knowledge is limited i think uh to how psychological counseling or examinations and evaluations are used uh more to like seminary uh although if you know i see how it's used in other settings as well but there in particular that how have individuals evaluated on all these different levels for holy orders 
and uh, evaluated psychologically, academically, personally, in terms of how they engage with others in their community. Uh, but, you know, when I look back, certainly at my own formation or seminary formation, and there was nothing of this, and uh, not even an introduction to this in, in the sense of how one, you know, the psychology, the anthropology, the spirituality behind the, the writings of, of the fathers. Uh, and that really is meant to make us living icons of the gospel to conform us to Christ, not to this particular perfect image of a priest or good priest. Remember Fulton Sheen saying, you know, that they never uh, teach a person in seminary. They always say, you know, they're teaching them to be a good priest, uh, but, uh, but not uh, a good uh, like sacrifice, uh, which is what Christ becomes, uh, that this kind of dying to self, to sin, uh, and living for God alone. And, you know, four years in seminary of taking courses and, you know, being evaluated by one's, you know, superiors or by one's uh, classmates. It's just, it's not, it's not going to do it. And it's not going to do anything. And, and unless there are individuals, I think, that have this capacity because they've been formed in this to be able to guide others along that same path. And so it almost needs the formation, I think, for holy orders almost has to be more monastic, certainly, than it does need, than it needs to be academic. Not that there's any problem with academic formation or that it doesn't come into play but you know what kind of servant you know is this going to make a person who is or ordained if they have not been formed in the very spirit of christ and the gospel and uh you know i have to say that i've learned more from reading the fathers than i learned from everything in seminary like, uh, and I loved my seminary, don't get me wrong, and I loved the people there and the, the priest there, but I've never used any of my notes from seminary. And I don't know if that says anything about me about, as a note taker <laughs> or not, but it's just, there's something about when you're thrust into the life, you know, whether it's the confessional or people coming to talk to you as a priest and the constant humbling that, that takes place uh, in the course of one's life, but also the participation and how others have been humbled by life too, you know, entering into their sorrows, their pain, you know, two weeks of that, you know, teaches you more than uh, anything that one learns in seminary. And when you come out and you first experience that, you want to cry out like Jeremiah, you duped me, oh God, and I allowed myself to be duped, you know, by draw drawing me along this path for which I'm completely and, and utterly un unfit. And, uh, you know, it's interesting in some of the Eastern churches, they'll draw their bishops, you know, from the monasteries. You know, often those who, in fact, lived in the desert, and we brought up Pope Shenouda here a number of different times, and that indeed was the, the case for him. You know, had lived in the desert for many years and in deep solitude, and then even after he was uh, made bishop, the, made the, the Coptic Pope, was exiled uh, by Anwar Sadat uh, for many years, and, uh, and so, you know, suffered deeply. And if you've ever read his writings, it all comes through with perfect clarity. Uh, why don't we do this last one about Abba Moses, number 17. A monastic gathering was once convened in the skeet. 
the fathers wanting to test Abba Moses insult, insulted him with the following words. Why does this Negro want to be among us? Abba Moses, though he heard this, said nothing. When the meeting had ended and the brothers dispersed, several said to Abba Moses, you, were you not at all disturbed by what you heard? I was upset, he replied, but I did not speak. So, you know, he was upset, but he did not speak. You know, he saw the truth of, not the truth of what they were saying, but the ugliness of what they were saying. And so, you know, justice in some sense would speak to the heart and enough to create this anger within him or to make him upset, rightly so. But his first step, as it is for all of us, is to remain silent. The heart might be raging uh, at what has been said to us, if it's a lie or if it's disparaging uh, in this way, even racist in, uh, in this way. Uh, but what does one as a Christian do in the face of racism, of sexism, of violence, of a whole host of things within our world? What is the Christian response to terrorism? Of, of our day, uh, you know, because I think our, our minds and hearts can be as reactive to as anyone else as to what we see going on within the world and uh, of wanting to, to defend ourselves from what seems to be an imminent threat. Uh, but yet we are confronted with the gospel, as well as these stories that we read over and over again. And we are confronted with the cross uh, as the redeeming path, not only for ourselves, but for the world, our participation in the redemptive work of Christ. What does that really mean for us? And in this sense, Abba Moses is imitating Christ himself, who remained silent in the face of so many accusations or the things that were said of him. And uh, so there, there's a lot for us certainly to think about here. And as I said, there are paragraphs to come that I, I think will place it in a certain context for us, but it's never going to make it easy. You know, I think there's always going to be something that's unsettling to the mind that creates a crisis that uh, of mind and heart that i think is important for us to undergo uh in order that the mind and the heart might open up to the truth and the word that god is seeking to speak to us whatever it is that we need to hear so solid food my friends not not easy to digest this for sure so thank you all uh i know it's challenging but for thank you all for hanging in and also for joining us on uh the new year's day great pleasure as always and thanks for your questions and comments so have a great week everybody and uh i'll see you on wednesday for the letter of divine sign name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.